Jordan McDaniel, and I have the great privilege to serve as lead pastor here at Faith Christian Fellowship. Uh, that feeling is still very fresh and new, and so I love that. Uh, but I want to add my greetings to those of Doug and the worship team, as well as Pastor Mike, that if you're a guest with us, we're excited that you're here for uh, obvious reasons. We love to see new faces, and we're encouraged by that. We also are glad if you are a, a family member at Faith Christian, we're glad you're here as well. So I extend my greetings to both of you, whichever of those categories you fall into. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning. In late April of 2013, uh, a young woman, bless her heart, uh, went into a hospital in Dallas, Texas for a particular ailment that she was struggling with, but she was uh, late-term pregnant with a child. That child had never experienced any kind of prenatal care up to that point. The first time that she was in the hospital, he was, she was approximately eight plus months pregnant and never had any prenatal care whatsoever. Three days later, after admitting herself into the hospital or being admitted into the hospital, three days later, a little boy was born, May 1st of 2013. He was inflicted and, and basically, in his system, addicted to all manner of drugs, heroin and methamphetamines, and he was himself now addicted, now affected by that reality that sadly his mother had subjected him to. For, two, for four weeks, the doctors and nurses did everything they could to bring him off of that addiction. They used another powerful drug, morphine, to gradually bring that about, to help him to withdraw off of those, those drugs in his system. They cycled through it, ever diminishing those, that that drug, that morphine, ever diminishing it, hoping that his body would respond. After one cycle, it was evident that his body was not responding. All this time, he's in the NICU, obviously being cared for 24 hours a day, around the clock. The first cycle of morphine didn't work. His body was showing unresponsiveness to that, so they had to start all over again. And so he was once again put on heavy dosage of morphine, and a second cycle of bringing him off was, began. This time, by God's grace, the second cycle started to work. And his, the drugs in his system began to subside, and his, his body was beginning to take back over. And they got to the end of that second cycle, and the doctors and nurses determined that he was safe to remove from the NICU and ultimately then to be ushered out of the hospital and into the care of a loving family. On May 29th, exactly four weeks after his birth, he was sent away from the hospital. And on that same day, my wife Beverly and I received a phone call from a social service worker saying, would you consider having a child placed in your home of these circumstances? We were foster parents at the time, and so this was what we felt like God had called us to do. And so we said, of course, we would love to have a child in our home, as you've described. They said, well, have you ever had a, a drug-exposed child before? Mm, not to our knowledge. <laughs> we haven't. What, and they said, uh, well, they tend to be irritable, very troubled. And, uh, you'll have probably a really difficult time with them, to be honest. So we said, well, no, we'll, we'll work with that. That's fine. So what began a journey of approximately 17 months of fostering this little guy in our home. On October 23rd, 2014, Isaiah Gordon McDaniel was adopted into our home to be a forever son in our lives. Thank you. Praise God for that. October 23rd, 2014 would change our lives. Obviously, it, we were changed prior to that, but that would be a day that would be more memorable to us than, than almost any in the life of our family, in the life of me individually, in the life of our marriage, my wife and I, and then in the life of our family with our other two children, our biological son and our biological daughter. 
that we would have the chance to welcome him in to our home. He was delightful. From day one, he was delightful. Pretty early on, he began to sleep longer and longer through the night. His disposition was always one that was uh, surprisingly laid back and joyful as, as he began, as his emotions began to show themselves out. Impact of drug exposure was not really detectable to us. Sadly, we looked at our own biological kids and we were like, what was going on with you? <laughs> if this is rough, what was, what was your excuse? But for two and a half years, we have enjoyed the presence of Isaiah in our home. We're actually in a sermon series that it may sound a little bit strange, and I hope through the next several minutes to tie this together, but we've been in a sermon series that we've entitled Foundations. What the intent uh, with, with this was to give exposure and attention and time to the subject of the foundations of this church, the doctrines of our faith, summarize what we hope to be God's word brought to simple definitions areas that have been clearly defined as our faith, what we also hope has been that which is consistent with what was handed down to us for generations, now 2,000 years, where the church, followers of Jesus Christ that have gone on before us, have wrestled with. And so now as we have a statement of doctrine for Faith Christian Fellowship, I got this off of the, the desk at the entryway, it's on your website, that's been our guide for this sermon series over the past few months, and we are coming near the end, and we are almost there. Today, we are going to look at the three final doctrines as they're listed. Again, in order of importance is not necessarily the idea, but as they are listed in our doctrinal statement, we're looking at them today. I share them with you here. Salvation, the assurance of the believer, and eternal security. Giving some description to each one, let's look at them. Salvation, we believe that salvation is the gift of God, brought to man by grace and received by personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, whose precious blood was shed on Calvary for the forgiveness of our sins. The assurance of the believer. We believe that it is a privilege of the believer, it is the privilege of the believer, of believers to rejoice in the assurance of their salvation through the testimony of God's word, which however clearly forbids the use of Christian liberty as an occasion to the flesh. And lastly, eternal security. We believe that salvation is an eternal state that once truly secured cannot be lost. I take great joy in being able to walk us through what I think is the foundations for these three points of our doctrine. Let me make a quick clarification Secure, and we will find this as as we work through today's message. Security and assurance are two sides of the same coin. The idea that we are secure in our eternal destiny and that sense of assurance of that security are two different things, distinct though related, two sides of one coin. Security is the idea of being of the idea of being secure is God's work and his alone. We do not establish our security in him. He establishes it. Assurance is the faith in which we operate knowing that we are secure. That is our assurance. It is two sides of the same coin. If the security is in God's hands, Assurance is what he invites us to to rest in because of that security. If some of you are like me, you lock your doors at night in your home for the protection that it provides. Maybe if you have an alarm in your home, you might set that alarm for the same reason. And if you're like me, you go up and you lay down in your bed and you go, did I lock my door? (laughs) I can't remember. And oftentimes I didn't. That's the sad part. But anyway, we go and we relock. But security is one thing, and that sense of assurance is another. We might have had every door locked. We might have cages around our house. We might have security. But at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, do I feel, do I know that I am secure? And do I have that sense of assurance? It's two sides of the same coin. 
And all of it falls back to the subject of our salvation. And I hope to unfold that for you here today. I'd invite you, if you would, to turn to Romans chapter 7. And hopefully as we do this, you'll understand more and more why I shared the story with you of our family and our adoption of Isaiah into our home forever. Romans chapter 7. If you would, I'd invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word. I'll read it aloud, and either on your device or your hard copy of God's word, I invite you to read along with me. I'll be using the NASB, New American Standard Bible, as my version. Your version is fine if it is not that, but I wanted to give you that forewarning. Chapter 7 of Romans, verse 14 and on, I read it aloud here. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I'd like to do, what would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So, no, so now, no longer am I, doing, am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good I want, for the good that I want, I do not do, but practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Chapter 8, verse 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, we ask that your word would be our guide, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, that things that are false and untrue of you and of your word would be discarded, and that truth and transformation from that truth would be the work of the Holy Spirit for us today, that we would not leave today without doing business with you on these terribly important subjects of our salvation, our security, and our assurance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. A few weeks ago, when I was up here on another occasion, I shared with you that there is a book in the Bible, all the Bible, inspired Uh, profitable and sufficient for life and practice, every bit of it from beginning to end. There is no distinction in that regard. And yet we recognize that there are certain places that we fall into like a soft pillow and comforter of strength, of encouragement. Certain places within God's word where it just, we continually go to because it clarifies and it strengthens us. Well, like a boulder that sets in the middle of the Christian faith and Christian doctrine is the book of Romans. Paul takes great length and great pains to describe for us, believers in Jesus Christ, the reality of, that, of our relationship to God through Christ. What it was before and what it was as a result of his work. It is a boulder that sets in the middle of us that we cannot move, we cannot manipulate, we have to deal with. And it clarifies for us so many of the things that we run in doubt and suspicion of. That is the book of Romans. What I'd love to do is for the moments that we have together is to do a very, very quick and inadequate but hopefully meaningful survey of, this, of the first portion of this book because I think it sets the stage well for the subject of our salvation, our security, and our ultimate assurance. 
If you're not familiar with it, the book of Romans, we just read a small portion out of it, and we will get to that in a few minutes. It begins in the first three chapters, or really two and a half chapters, Romans 1 to 3, describing for us the depravity, the, the desperation that every human being finds him or herself in. That we are forever desperate. There is a hole that we exist in that cannot be climbed out of with any effort of our own. There is, it is so ever deep and unattainable that we would come out of it. See, the church in Rome was made up of primarily, most likely, Gentile believers, Greek and Roman. Most likely Gentile dominated. But, as with so many of the churches of the New Testament, Romans, the church at Rome, is probably also woven in with Jewish believers. So both are being addressed by Paul in this great book. In the first chapter of Romans, if you're at all familiar with it, it speaks of this idea that we are responsible for, if for no other reason than God has revealed himself more than adequately in the things that we see around us. And so much so that we are held accountable for that, if only for that, we are accountable. God has done all he needed to do to reveal himself in that way. But what did we do in our sin? We exchanged the worship of the creator for the worship of his creation. We have turned everything that is natural and expected in that relationship between us and God, we've made what is natural in that relationship unnatural. And we have rebelled against what should be for us an obvious choice in our life. None of us is free of that. As he describes the relationship between Jew and Gentile, the Jewish members of this church were those who had the promise, the gift of the promise, the gift of the covenants, that God had been dealing with them in a unique way for generations. And for the Gentiles, they were always outside of that, that faith. They were outside of it. They were without the law. The Jewish people were blessed with the law. But when he gets to the end of it, he realizes in both cases, we are in the same situation. When all of that is said and done, we are in the same place, and that is in a massive hole for which there is no escape, Jew or Gentile. At the beginning of chapter 3, he describes that none of us seek after God, not one. No one chases after him on our own. We have rejected him. And then if you would, turn to chapter 3 of Romans. He begins to make a transition. If that is the dark, desperate reality that we start in, he starts to make a turn towards the end of chapter 3. I read in verse 21, if you'd like to follow along, he says this, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. His reason for speaking to that distinction or that no longer being a distinction is the very thing I was just saying. Jew and Gentile, let me tell you, everyone, you're all in the same boat. In your sin and now, more importantly, in the solution. There is a singular path to that solution, and that solution is the person of Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile. And this great verse that we all probably have heard multiple times, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift, hang on to that word, gift, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. That word is a payment for God's wrath, for God's demand, a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
the just and the justifier. Not only the object, but also the one who accomplishes it. He's the object of justice, and he is the one that brings about justice. Verse 27, for where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. There is nothing. There is absolutely nothing. When he has spent two and a half or more chapters dealing with the depravity that we had, he begins in this section that I've just read to make a turn, to start to turn the reality and say, you need to know how desperate the situation is because you need to know how great a Savior you have. And it is God's work that is going to bring that about. Should we boast in the law? What does he mean by that? Should we boast in keeping the law, in working and showing ourselves worthy? May it never be. For the law has revealed our sin. Grace has provided the solution. Only the work of God through Christ. He begins to make this, and he brings in these words, just, this word justification. So for the next two chapters, he helps us understand what is Justification. What is that? Well, he uses in chapter 4, if we were to continue on, kind of doing our sweep over survey, in chapter 4, he begins to define what it is to be justified. And he uses a very memorable character of Scripture, the man Abraham. Abraham, it says in chapter 4, Paul reverts back to the Old Testament and he says, by faith, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What was his work? Belief. Belief. That was it. That was Abraham's work, if you can even label it as such. Belief. God had made promises that Abraham simply believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. In the Old Testament, there were two types of covenants. There was this idea of a unilateral covenant. We know them today. Covenant is not an unfamiliar word, though we don't use it. It sounds a little old style. If you're married here today, maybe the pastor who married you referred to this idea of covenant, which I think is appropriate. But we don't use it every day. I think you probably understand an agreement, a contract of sorts, but far deeper. But there are two covenants in the Old Testament that are described. Let me give you the two most prominent examples. One is the Abrahamic covenant, the one I just mentioned, to Abraham. God and Abraham had a relationship, and it was, in the end, unilateral. What does that mean? Well, two people enter into an agreement, into a covenant, or the idea is that a covenant is that which two people enter into, when it's unilateral, all of the responsibility and all of the effects of that covenant are taken on by one side and not the other. Unilateral. The story is told of Abraham and God entering into this contract, this covenant. And what was very common is, what was the cultural experience was that you would sever animals. You guys that are hunters out there kind of get it, right? But you would tear apart these animals and you would set them one side on one and one on the other. And then in the agreement, these two parties would walk between those severed carcasses. And they would basically be saying to each other, if either of us fails to fulfill our share in this covenant, may it be like these animals for us. When Abraham and God made this agreement, Abraham was sleeping on the side of the bank. And God, while Abraham slept, walked through those severed animals. What was he saying? I'm taking full responsibility for the fulfillment of this covenant. Abraham was asleep. He made no attempt to walk through 
God allowed him to stay on one because God knew this is my responsibility and mine alone. And Abraham believed God, as Paul says in chapter 4, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He didn't do a thing. Now, there is another example in the Old Testament. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, but the other great covenant of the Old Testament is that of the Mosaic Covenant. That was truly bilateral, which meant that in this case, God and Israel being the two parties of the covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, God and Israel agreed that if either of us breaks this covenant, cursing will come. Blessing for holding the covenant, cursing for breaking it. Well, a little spoiler alert. One held it and one did not. Any guesses? God faithfully, faithfully fulfilled his role of the covenant and over and over again, Israel failed it. And cursing came. God was gracious and forbearing and it, the very first time it, it annulled it the first offense, and God kept returning back and saying, if you would only come back, I'll let you have this covenant all over again if you would only carry your portion of it faithfully. And they failed over and over and over again. We get to the New Testament, and we are described to have now a new covenant. Do you know which covenant it is modeled after? Which of those two do you think it's modeled after? The new covenant looks far more like the Abrahamic covenant. For if Abraham was asleep when God established this relationship with him and took upon himself all of the responsibility to fulfill that relationship, if Abraham was asleep, we were worse. We were dead. Dead. Ephesians chapters 1 and 2 describe to us that reality. We were dead. Abraham was at least just asleep. We walk into it dead. So is it unilateral or is it bilateral? The new covenant was established by God alone. And he took all of the responsibility to carry it out in full faithfulness. That's the point of chapters 4 and 5. Abraham simply believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In chapter 5, he describes the scenario that this goes way back to the beginning. In case any of us are wondering, was there a time where we had something to do with our own salvation? Was there any point in time? And he says, in Adam, all have sinned. In Adam, all have sinned. Forgive the sort of graphic nature of this, but the idea of it is this, that in Adam's loins, we all existed. We are his descendants. That's the picture that we have. In him, when he failed, we were in Adam. And so therefore, we sin. That's the reality all of us can get really upset about that with Adam, our father. We can get really upset about it. Had we been given that same choice, the Bible teaches we would have made the exact same decision to rebel against a loving father. That would have been our story. But in fact, it was Adam as our representative. Read with me if you would. Go to chapter 5, but listen to what he says. Such an unbelievable chapter of God's word, Romans chapter 5. Towards the end, listen to how he describes it. Verse 18. So, that, so then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Adam transgressed. He sinned. Condemnation swept over humanity. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners... Even so, so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. You hear that? Who's responsible for this? In Adam, we all were destined to sin. 
We were condemned in Adam. In Christ, what does it say? The many? No, it says the one who was righteous will bring justification for the many. The one. His righteousness and his alone is what we base any salvation upon. He continues, the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where the sin where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we got a call on May 29th of 2013 and said, would you take this little boy who has all of these broken things in his life and would you give him a chance would you give him a simple chance two and a half years later we can't even imagine that God would give us the privilege of giving this little guy a chance we look at him today two and a half years later and we can't find any specific there may be some later in life any impact of his depravity we can't find it. He is as joyful and as, as delightful as a little guy as we could ever have imagined. And we look at him every day and we see his face and we go, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? God, that you have given us this privilege to be a part of his adoption. You see, I was a biological child. By God's grace, and there is nothing wrong with this. This is what God designed, is that a mom and a dad would give nurturing love and unconditional love to a child, and I was the product of that. My mother and dad did that for me. So I don't know what it is to be physically in this earth. I don't know what it is to be adopted. Whether you are that or you are like our family where you have gone through that step, it changes. It's an amazing thing what it does to you when you think of family as it's described in God's word. Because the reality is, and I know you know this, we have all been adopted. Every single one of us. And when we got that call, or when he was born, when little Isaiah was born in the hospital on May 1st, when he was born and a whole team of doctors and nurses, Isaiah had nothing to do with that. God decided that he would bring doctors and nurses into his life that would begin to bring him back to health. And they would put a terrible drug into his system to try and relieve him from the drugs that were injected into him prior to that in utero. And these gentle hands took care of him and brought him to a a level of health that then he could be handed over to a a very inadequate family that is going to say, all we can do is continue hopefully, to provide this nurturing experience for him. How involved was Isaiah in any of these decisions? It was simply by God's grace that he decided to do this for him or anyone else. And as adopted children, I don't have that physical, earthly experience. But, and I still don't, except I'm now the dad of a son whose story will include that. And I'll come back to that in a few moments. Chapter 6 verse of, of Romans. Chapter 6 goes on to tell us what are the implications of our justification. What are the implications that God, for nothing other than his own mercy, reached in and rescued us, and did so by no merit of ours, but only by the grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the one, righteousness came to, all men, to, to the many. Chapter 6 begins to describe that, for it says that as Christ was buried, so have we been buried with him. So that now as he has been resurrected, we now live a new life in him. Our resurrection is his resurrection. Chapter 6 goes on to explain the implications of all that. I invite you to read with me in verse 20 of chapter 6. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What does that mean? You couldn't be right. You were free. All you could do was sin. Every time you were, you were confronted with a decision, the only, a right and a left, the only thing you could do, there was no right hand. 
There was only a left, and I just kept following it in my sin. I just kept choosing it. I was free from righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? That's all you could choose, right? What makes you ashamed now? That's all you were free to choose. For the outcome of those things was death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification. The outcome, eternal life. And then another very, very familiar verse for many of us. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to see that distinction. I want you to see the distinction of wage and gift. They are as far apart as the east from the west, right? To to borrow a metaphor. They don't touch each other. A wage is 180 degrees other than a gift. A wage is earned. A gift is unearned. For our sin, death was earned. For eternal life, it was given. There's nothing, that distinction needs to be ever poignant in our minds. Our wage, our our, our death, sin and death was earned. It was a wage. You were paid for this. You earned it. And then 180 degrees. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul wants us to understand that it had nothing to do with us. Security is based upon God's work. That is security. When there will come a day when Isaiah comes to me or my wife or us together, and he's going to he's going to wrestle, I'm pretty sure, that he's going to wrestle with the idea that dad, which is what he calls me, amazing. Dad, I wasn't a part of this family to begin with. I'm different than Nick. I'm different than Hope. And I love my oldest son and my older daughter. I love love them dearly. But I get the chance to tell Isaiah, Isaiah, your name is my name. Your resources are my resources. Your inheritance is my inheritance. There is no distinction. You cannot earn this, Isaiah. You cannot earn it. You are as much my son as Nick, and you're as much my child as my daughter, Hope. Your big brother and sister, that's what they are to you. And just like, you know who, uh, my big brother, and it is not, it is not something small that I call him that. My big brother has secured for me a place in God's family. And when God sees me, he sees the exact same as his own son, I've been adopted, and God's name and his resources and his inheritance is mine. Why do we not feel assured? If we are secure, if that is a statement of our security, why, what is, what is the, the subject of our assurance? Well, that's really where chapter 7 and to some extent 8 come into play. See, because Paul, when he writes this, recognizes that one of the greatest thieves to our security is our own sin. We wake up every morning and we see ourselves failing that father who has adopted us. We sin over and over again. And we have this, we have this tendency to, to work backwards and go, well, so I'm not assured I must not be secure. Security is God's work. 
We need to put a bow on that, tie it up, and say, done. You are my son. You are my daughter. Chapter 7 and chapters 8 of Romans indicate to us that there are consequences and effects of our sin. Remember what we read at the beginning. He says, you know what? It's, it's the sin that dwells in my flesh. In my mind, I'm convinced that I am a son of God, that, I am his, that I'm his adopted son. I'm convinced of that, but, I, but I'm constantly doubting it. Why? Because I'm watching myself disregard it. I'm seeing myself offend and, and break the heart of my father every day. And in fact, we do. But what he is telling us is, from through chapter 7, he's describing all of the things that I want to do, I don't do. And all the things I don't want to do, I do. What a wretched, wretched man I am. And how does he follow that? But thanks be to God. And in chapter 8, verse 1, for there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Chapter 8 goes on to describe that a, a life led in the Spirit is a, is a confirmation that we are, in fact, sons of God. What it is not saying is that you are not a son of God. It is the statement of our assurance God wants us to know that we are his children. He has no intention for that to be mysterious to us. And it is our own sin that makes it mysterious. We're clouded. And therefore, we question our security. And chapter 8 is this chapter that builds into the idea that what you need to know, you know what the remedy of feeling unassured is? Is to go back to the very beginning and know I am your father, and I love you. And because of that, I invite you to enjoy my fellowship. That's what I want. That's what's assuring. It's not what is securing. That's already been decided. It's what's assuring to me that he invites me to recognize. Gordon, when you, when you live outside of the leading of my spirit, the greatest tragedy of that is not that you've lost your position as my son, it's that you don't know you're my son anymore. And he says, he says in the middle of chapter 8, he says, but that you would call me Abba, Father. What does that mean? And maybe many of you have heard this before. It means Daddy. Daddy. That the solution... We are encumbered by sin each and every day. The solution is not to doubt that we are a son. The solution is to go back to the fact that we are a son or daughter. That is the solution. We don't work for it. We don't strive for it. Our assurance, if we strive for it, the epitome, again, I've said this before, the epitome of arrogance is to think I have some responsibility in it. Not to know that it is secure. Why do I know that it's secure? Because he did it. Not me. That's the opposite of arrogance. It's arrogance keeps me from that. Surrender says, I can't do this. And if not for you, it wouldn't have never happened. But because of you, it did happen. And that's what makes me secure. And so when we struggle with our assurance... What he's saying in chapter 7 and then ultimately in chapter 8 is the solution to this is to remember again that you are my child. You are my child. You don't need to live enslaved to sin. You are not enslaved to sin. You have the freedom to choose. And, I, and that is as a result of your sonship or daughtership in my family. That's the solution. Remember, to Abraham, he believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Believe him. This is what he said, and this is what he did. Believe him. In chapter 8, at the end of it, this is where we kind of begin to wrap up. He says in verse 31, 
just an absolutely heavyweight passage of Scripture. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Do you know that you can't even bring your own charge against him? It's told of uh, a story of the, that um, the biggest stumbling block to Gandhi coming to faith, he really respected Jesus, right? One of the biggest stumbling blocks for Gandhi to come to faith was that he could not surrender his sin. He said, I have to take care of my sin. I, I cannot turn that over to anybody else. The problem that I have with it is that I have to account for my own sin. What a sad situation. Because I can't. I cannot account for it. So God said, I, remember unilaterally, I will take this new covenant upon me and I will deal with your sin. And I will have an eternal solution for it. The blood of my own son. We can't even bring our own charge, for it is God is the one who justifies. Who is the one that condemns? If we had a condemner, it would be be easily put on the shoulders of one, Jesus Christ. He could hold us utterly condemned, but in fact, what does he do? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised and who sits at the right hand, who intercedes for us. I don't condemn you. I intercede for you. I pray for you. That's what I do, Jesus says. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we, are, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Security? Assurance. The invitation is to know that the sonship has already been given. A gift. A gift. And I close with kind of tying up the illustration. There will come a day, and I I mentioned this a moment ago, there will come a day when Isaiah will become old enough to know the details of his life. We won't hide that from him. He'll come to know that. It would be out of place for us to try and hide that from him. He'll know his story. But I'm compelled each and every day while, while he experiences life as it is now, that he will be so assured while I have this chance, that he will be so assured, Isaiah, there is nothing, nothing that you can do to ever change this. For him, he's oblivious right now. For him, Nick is his big brother. Hope is his big sister. Beverly is his mom, and I'm his dad. And nothing ever enters his mind other than that. There will come a day through his choices, and there will be times where to all three of our children, we will say, Nick, Hope, Isaiah, that's not how a McDaniel behaves. We don't do that. And when you do that, it breaks my heart. And even some of the most severe examples, it breaks fellowship. We cannot easily relate because of certain decisions you are making But I'll look at Nick, I'll look at Hope, and exactly the same way I will look at Isaiah, and I will say, but you're still my child, and nothing will ever change that. And Isaiah, different than our other two, will probably have to wrestle with that. And it will be our opportunity, task, privilege to tell him, Isaiah, nothing will ever change this. You do not wake up each day hoping that you will earn the name McDaniel and hoping that you will be allowed to stay in this home another day and that you will 
not forfeit ultimately our relationship. It will not happen. And more than me, his dad, I have a father in heaven who says that to me every day. You are my son. Behave like it? Absolutely. Conduct yourselves accordingly? No question. But don't ever doubt it. Don't ever, ever doubt it. If you're here today, there's really two people that I want to speak to today. One is, are you a part of this family? This family, not not just this family, though that's an element of it. Are you a part of a family of a father who says there is nothing you can do that will ever change my love for you? Nothing. As many times as you break my heart, you break the heart of a father, not a stranger. A father who loves you deeply. If that's never been your embrace, please don't leave here today without giving someone an opportunity, myself or someone here, one of our deacons or pastors or just a friend maybe you came with, I don't know, who can say to you, please don't take another day apart from this family because he is calling out to grow his family. He wants to grow it as large as he can grow it while there is still time. Put your faith in his son who has bought you a position within that family. And there's another group of you that are here that maybe, while that is absolutely true, you walk away, you walk out of here, or you wake up every day and you go, God, am, am I going to, am I going to, earn it again today, or am I going to just rest in it? And I feel like I have to earn it. My invitation to you is similar but different, is to say, please, please know that your Heavenly Father is right where He always was. He's not gone anywhere. And He's asking you, do you know that you're my son? Do you know that you're my daughter? I don't want you to live in fear of that. That's not, that's not how I plan for this. I plan for you to rest and enjoy it. Enjoy it. It's one of the craziest things. We, we think our Christian life is this, is this job. It was a gift meant to be enjoyed. So if you're in one of those two, please don't leave today. If you're not secure because you don't have a relationship with God, Resolve that today. And if you are secure, but you just daily forget, and your assurance is lost moment by moment, please know, like you as a mother or a father maybe, that's never the case with your child. And all the more, it is never the case with your Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Bless this day, our Heavenly Father. Goodness gracious, we are sons and daughters of the Almighty, the one who has invited us to be a son or daughter, all on the part of your own grace and mercy. And Lord, that is a secure thing that can never be taken away. As you said, and through your son Jesus himself, those who the Father has given me, I have lost not one. Bless this day, we pray. May we be renewed in our heart of these truths. In Jesus' name. Amen.